Ah, that's my cue. Hello and welcome and thanks for joining us. So glad you could be here. Hey, here's the question for today's episode. Uh, it's two questions, actually. Where are you when it comes to automation? Or could you make a list of what kind of things you've been automating or that you want to do, want, want to automate? Because I think it's funny if you think through that, because assuming you're probably not doing it right here on the fly, but it's funny how a simple question might raise more, well, questions than answers because automation is such a such a broad term. We've all been beat down with it and we need to automate everything because there's a lot of benefits. It covers everything from simple to complex. And yes, it's good, but there may be things on your list that are not really automation. And the point I wanna make is that language is very important here. In fact, it could be a source of frustration either already and you just didn't realize where it's coming from or it could be a source of frustration for upcoming projects. So today we are diving into islands of automation. We'll explain that more, it'll become obvious. We're gonna explore how to recognize any islands that you may have in your operation, the value of connecting them, and the importance of drawing straight lines from the goals, from them to the goals of your organization. So we've got two experts on with us ready to share multiple real world examples for how this topic needs more attention and they're gonna walk us as well through the WWT automation journey, plus labs that you can access both to learn and test your own ideas before ever even having to think about maybe putting them into your own production systems. Guys, welcome to Tech 37. This is your home for technology, education, and collaboration. My name is Rob Boyd, I'm your host. It's time to meet the experts. All right, experts, how, how are you guys doing? You feeling good this morning? Great, this thank you very much. Good morning for all of us. That's what we just great, became bro. afternoon, didn't it? We're here for on Central Time anyway. Well, let me, I'm gonna introduce your formal titles because I wanna ask you guys to expand on this just a moment if you don't mind. And we'll start with Philip because I've got you in the guest one slot. So Philip Palmer, you're practice, and correct me of course if I get this wrong, you're practice manager uh, for automation and orchestration. I get that right? That's absolutely positively correct. So, well, how would uh, you describe yourself, though, in your role that's important for today? Yeah, I would describe myself as a enterprise service management best practice and, and process nerd. Um, automation to me is really about focusing on business outcomes. And if you're going to focus on business outcomes, it's very, very important to understand some of the basic tenets of uh, that have been around forever around, you know, process management, uh, the underlying procedures, the, you know, the actions and the tasks that have that, that make those things up. Um, one of the stories I've, I've told for a number of years is every single piece of IT that existed in the history of ever has existed <laughs> to do one thing, which is to automate a business process. And we can look at something as simple as email and go back to the days when uh, if you're as old as me, uh, I went to typing class and I had to learn how to type a memo and, you know, to, from subject date, specific carriage returns and all those things. And now you look at email and what do you have to from subject the data is automatic you don't have to remember people's names anymore you know that was something that was created to automate something that uh had always been there so instead of filing cabinets we now have active directory and, and storage devices all those type of things so that's kind of how i like to look at automation and the yeah. people within my teams and how we like to attack it and help our customers well darn you philip you know we obviously we meet beforehand to prepare these episodes but that out of all the stories you've already told me and the analogies and metaphors that you've brought into it which have all been mm -hmm. impressive i hadn't heard that one and i also took uh because i'm also old uh I, I gotta be older than you but either way i'm aging worse i guess what it, i took a typing class and in, in, in high school mainly because it was easy credits for what i was at the high school for the performing arts but it was and I still to this day think maybe it was the most valuable class I took because my ability to use all my fingers and type quickly has been of great use in this world we now find ourselves in. But what a great reminder that you make of, of how we've lost track of how simple automation really is at the core of everything that we started doing from a, from a digitization perspective to use another over, well, a much more overblown term. We'll leave it at that. I'm gonna come back to you in just a second, but let's introduce Tanner. You've been on with me in Tech 37 before, your global director of AI ops. But um, what you do for Worldwide is a little bit different uh, in, in terms of just looking com comparatively speaking to Philip, and for the purposes of this conversation, can you kind of tell us how do you describe your role and maybe its relation to Philip's? Sure, yeah, As at Worldwide, we look at automation really being part of a programmatic journey, right? <clears throat> so if we look at automation and orchestration at large, 
there are multiple chapters to that to really to achieve, which we'll talk about today, an, an orchestrated environment of automation. And I lead AI ops, which is really artificial intelligence driven IT operations. So it's both a contributor and recipient of an effective automation strategy. So if we start to look at the infrastructure, the data center as a point of automation, the services as a point of automation, we always have to remember to Philip's point, customer objective, you know, what, what our outcome is, that's ultimately what's valuable. And so AI ops allows us a means of observability and visibility and ultimately automation around the customer experience, whether that's at the application, you know, or it's in the data center, but it allows us really to take automation all the way to the edge, all the yeah. way to the end point. Okay. No, that, uh, I like that because that's, so this is going to become good for you to, to kind of reflect and keep us honest on a number of different things and how they connect. Mm -hmm. Because the first thing I want to start off with, because I think it forms the foundation for everything that we're talking about here. Uh, and this is something I teased uh, at the beginning on the round, the importance of language uh, when it comes to what we call automation, because I also am guilty of probably using this term a little bit more flippantly um, than I should. And it was learning from Philip here. Philip, you know, um, I, I, I want to explore what effect this has, and I'm just going to go ahead and prompt you directly with another story that you already did tell me, but I think it's worth repeating if you don't mind, or if you've already changed it with a better one, then you do what you need to do. But it was about eating in a restaurant, and you use that as an example about the language of understanding the difference between really what's in your title, because in your title it says A&O, or automation and orchestration. Do you mind right. telling us what's important here in language-wise? Yeah, so a lot of customers come to us um, around automation and, and it's the usual themes around automation. I want to go faster. I want to spend less. I want to optimize my resources. I want to increase revenue. Uh, the big part about it for me that a lot of people don't think about deep enough is around the optimizing risk standpoint. So all of those things are great, but you still need to optimize risk there. But most folks co who come to us around automation are really looking at an orchestration play. Um, and automation is a very, very large topic. But one of the things that I like to point out is going back to that process thing is there are multiple levels and layers when it comes to automation. So, you know, in my, you know, process wonk world, you know, there's like task automation, which is like, you know, checking things off a list. Those tasks roll up into an activity. There's activity automation. And then when you start getting into some true orchestration, you start looking at, you know, the process and or service automation. And the example that I, uh, that I've been given for a number of years around that is, um, you know, back in my old ITIL foundation training days, uh, when talking about process, uh, it, it's the same story we can tell around automation. Whereas, you know, have you ever eaten at a restaurant before? And everybody in the world talks about people, process, and technology. But this is a very clear way to kind of articulate that. So when you go to a restaurant, there are three main activities, if you will. We need a restaurant. You right, you seat the guests, you take the order, and then you cook the food, which delivers the outcome to the customer, which is they want to eat. Now, from a service standpoint, there's a whole lot of other things in there other than just delivering that food to that particular customer, but when I'm uh, seating the guests, there's a, a lot of uh, our technologies that I could use in there to help automate that particular activity of that end-to-end -end process. I could have uh, handheld devices or a phone where, um, where I, they come in and I have a, have a look at my handheld device and I can kind of see what seats are available. There's literal, when you get into high-class organizations, there's literal software that you can have that has a whole layout of your floor to help you do, if you will, capacity management and automate where you're gonna seat people, how many reservations that are coming in. Yeah. Once the guests are seated and you go to take the order, same thing. There's things that you can use to automate getting that order to the kitchen with handheld devices, or you can um, group different menu items together on there so you can just kind of hit it and know everything that uh, about that particular order. And if you really got super nerdy, and some of you may have seen this in today's world when you're cooking the food, they actually have you know burger flipping robots these days that they've been experimenting with. But we can take that all the way back to the beginning. And when you start to bring in technology around these things, and from an automation standpoint, that can even change the game. So in this analogy, I talked about seating the guests, then taking the order. But when you start to bring in different technology and start automating even the order taking process or the order taking activity, that might even flip things around the other way where you may have walked into a quick service restaurant where now you have a kiosk that you walk up to where you yeah. um, punch the order in first and then you yourself um, shift left. Some of you may have heard that. You're shifting left the whole seating the guest part you know, onto the customer and they can look through your store, figure out where they want to sit and they can seat themselves. And then from there, you know, the food is made. And um, when I used to live in Australia, there's not a lot of table service that's there. That's an extra service 
Uh, a lot of places you you go and you'll um, get your order at the counter and you get the little hockey puck that buzzes when your order's ready and you get up and you get it yourself. Yeah. So the point being is that this automation stuff that we talk about, there are various different levels and layers to that. And we see it all day, every day in our everyday world. And we start to think about, like in this example, the outcome is my customer wants to eat. Um, they want that food to be delivered to them. They don't want to have to worry about inventory management, maintaining the equipment, all those particular things. That's what they want. I'm going to bring this technology in. And if I bring in one piece of technology in one place, that could create a bottleneck somewhere else. So how do we look across those various activities so we can make sure that things are orchestrated appropriately and uh, give the gains that the people are looking for? Now, the last part of that, I will say from a maintenance standpoint, is if you think about some of the places that you've been to that have these kiosks, now take that. Now think about scale. Think about all the different quick service restaurants that might have these little uh, touch pads when you come in and about all the data that needs to be collected for that for each store. Right. And how do you scale that up and how do you how do you move that across? And that's a very real business problem that they have and that we have as well uh, across many industries. Yeah, because I mean, that stuff's going to they're going to tie back in. I used to run restaurants and and that was in the hotel business. And it was the you know food costing and things like this and being able to adequately project things that had a spoilage, you know, and as well as make sure you're not promising something to customers you can't deliver on because there's a key element missing or something to that effect. Um, I want to bring Tanner in on this because I'm just curious. Let's No secret, you guys at Worldwide are always uh, building and refining your practices in how you deliver services to customers. And Tanner, I know you play a part in a lot of this, and I know, Philip, you could answer this question as well. But as, as Philip has kind of broken out this notion of it's important to not confuse orchestration with automation because there's two distinct processes. And it sounds like orchestration also becomes the important, potentially missing element for um, being successful with automation. It's like those have to, you have to understand the relationship between them if you're going to be outcome focused, if I'm paraphrasing in, a, in an okay way. But yeah. Tanner, I, when most customers come to you guys at Worldwide, are they, do they already know what they want to automate or are they already on that journey? Where do you find most people kind of coming in? And then Philip, jump in whenever you want in terms of um, whatever Tanner says, if we agree or don't agree with what Tanner says. <laughs> For sure. And this is this is a constant conversation, right? No one comes yeah. in. The process would be a lot simpler if people came in and said, okay, we want to automate and orchestrate our environment. The reality is, is that automation answers some quick questions that are inside individual areas of the business. You know, we if we go back to our, which I mentioned before, but I think it's funny. We talk about automation islands. We have to see the archipelago right? We need oh, to see word. what all those islands, <laughs> what yeah. all those islands are, because if we can't, we can't understand the full landmass, right? Yeah. Moving it completely to geography as an example. What we do programmatically is that we assess the levels of maturity in all of those places and the dependency of those things and the, and the business outcome, the customer outcome, Philip said that, that I can't overstress that point. You know, whether you're looking at pure infrastructure automation or DevOps or AI ops or service orchestration, all of them must be observed and understood, but they all must be led by the objective to the business because otherwise you end up in a place where a lot of our customers are, and that is mature, but somewhat you know, uh, off kilter. They're moving in a direction, they're moving in lots of different directions with their automation uh, expectations. And I think Philip, I think he said this, but automated chaos is just faster chaos, mm. right? You're just, yeah. you're creating a wreck quicker with less people and less cost. And if done correctly, the objective-based programmatic approach is the, probably the biggest impact to the ROI for the business. If I want to know how the business itself can help my customer and not just solve an individual problem, understanding the programmatic dependency and really understanding the whole set of islands, you know, how do we see all of these things and the orchestration yeah. specifically is what allows us to start to stitch and tune to deliver that outcome at the end of the day. Yep. And how, how does that play Philip in terms of if, if yes, if I fundamentally agree that I need to look at the big picture and understand the outcomes to drive this kind of thing. But at the same time, I've got smart employees, you know, in, in my experience, a lot of automation stems from individuals who are making uh, decisions about making stuff easier for them to do. You know, it's one thing I love about right. developers and anyone with that mindset is they're like, ah, this feels repetitive and it's mistake prone. And so they're, they begin scripting and doing the different things that have the capacity to grow into automation projects. If someone's already going, 
are you saying that it's, is it dangerous for someone to already kind of have to fight back from that path? Or are you saying that's normal? Uh, here's that's where normal. you can pick back up. Okay. Well, we, we work with IT people, right? And IT people are, are, are curious beings and they, they like to solve problems. As problem a matter of fact, in, in, in my experience, when you remove the ability for these people to solve problems and to do complex, cool stuff, that's when they get mad. Nobody, there's a lot of IT folks who, um, who I've run across who feel like they, um, you know, they're highly qualified. They know a lot of stuff, but they're basically, their whole day is just, they're handed a shovel and they're told to dig a ditch, right? And they're just, you know, shoveling dirt all day long, but they've got, you know, they've got their backhoe license as a, as a really bad analogy that, you know, they, they have this great I'm engineering sure if you mind. Plan this metaphor very far or not. Keep going. <laughs> right, right. Because this is what so I do. I start a metaphor and it's genius. It's genius in my right, head right, until right, I have to right. carry it through. And then I'm like, oh, I shouldn't have started that way. But go ahead. Yeah, you're saying. Stop with Google or do I stop You've got with your certified backhoe. Is that what it was? Right, 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 right. Okay. So, but, but the point being is that, so you'll see a lot of, that's what I'm talking about, you know, action yeah. or task automation where they're doing isolated automations. They're scripting things to make their worlds better, but that can and uh, usually will create a bottleneck, you know, down the line. So now yeah. the next person in the line has all this extra information, things coming through. And then what, what we find is that then there's a, the natural progression from there is automation integration but there's still a lot of heavy lifting to get these two things to work together to integrate right as you start to grow and mature from there you'll start to see things around like functional automation as i like to say where now we're starting to look uh, across various different business functions so when i talk about functional automation i'm talking about hr finance you know those type of okay, business yeah. functions so we're at, we're at the business layer now so it's like i do this little script thing here in my little area um, that integrates with this little thing over here in this particular area, and that has an effect on the business in this particular way. So to, to go back and answer your question, there's nothing wrong with starting there. And matter of fact, um, we don't want to have analysis paralysis, right? Because you can spend, this is a problem in the enterprise service management space, especially. You can spend all day, day long talking about what the future could be, but there is a place that a lot of people can start. Um, infrastructure automation is a very simple place to start. Just like in my old days of enterprise service management, people used to ask me, hey, you know, you talked about all this best practice service management stuff, where do I start? And I used to say, well, it all depends. Best practice doesn't tell you where you should start. It now depends on a classic answer. Yeah, for most right, things. Right. Uh, now I know that that's crap. It's, you start with uh, request and incident management because that's going to be the easiest place to show a uh, return on investment. It's the Twitter feed of your organization and you can show people, you know, what's going wrong. Likewise in automation, infrastructure automation, you know, uh, at that particular level, it's fairly simple to, to put some things into place and kind of start there. But the important thing is to always, 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 comma, always, always focus on the business outcome. So when I do this, where does this end up, right? Um, right. Where is this going? I run into this often in my cloud management platform space area of uh, that discipline where everybody wants to provision things faster. I need to provision faster. I need to go faster with provisioning. And I'm always asking the question, why? What area of the business is this for? Why do you need to provision those things faster? What effect is that having? It shouldn't be just about, I have this stuff out in the cloud and I need to, I need to shove it out there um, quicker. It's what is the reason behind that and what effects are we having for that? And as a part of that journey, if you will, uh, I know that sounds very American Idol-ish, but uh, as a part of that journey, that's part of the questions that we that we ask. And we always want to make sure that we focus on. I think it's funny that that's what you chose that that sounded like. But yeah, American Idol. Right. Yeah. Speaking American of. Idol. Yeah, I'm go ahead, Tanner. I'm sure we touched on everything from heavy equipment to like uh, uh, TV shows. Um, I was going to back him up on this. This is something that I want people that are listening to this to understand. Automation is not, it's not a right or a wrong way. It's really a maturity. If you think about the fundamentals of digital transformation, what stops it? At the end of the day, it's not planning or technology. It's it's resistance and adoption. Yeah. And resistance and adoption, if you find their fundamentals, are always rooted in the fact that someone believes that this is not the most effective way. And so if we, if we look at a well-executed automation and orchestration engagement, we virtualize the infrastructure, right? We automate the infrastructure. We develop a system of governance to produce and deliver timely, great code and uh, great execution. We institute a self-healing environment through AI ops. You know, we are now addressing, we're moving the data center immediately and through automation based on the customer experience. And then we're making sure we're tuning and driving all of that with orchestration. 
adoption, people's willingness to move in the direction they want to move in or you want. All right. So Philip, it looks like Tanner got dropped for some reason. He started to freeze for a moment, maybe. And I'm going to, I want to have him tell our, the combine story when he comes back. But also oh, what yeah. I wanted to talk about though, was you have a little bit of show and tell. We had talked about doing this earlier. I'm not exactly sure what everything you're going to show, but what I loved is you're a pretty open person about being able to share, Hey, this is a route that we've been down. And here's also what some things look like when they start to get more mature and I know some of it dives into what you guys do with Worldwide and the path that you've been on, but it's the notion of, welcome back, but the notion of uh, <laughs> in understanding the strategy behind that is, um, is I think, important. So I want to come to that next after Tanner, but Tanner, as you were saying, is it, it you froze for a minute and then it disappeared completely, but yeah, I'm glad yeah. you made it back. Nothing bad happened. But um, uh, before we go to the show and tell with Philip next, um, I don't know what's pick up wherever you feel like you uh, left off there. <laughs> it, it just comes down to, it, it comes down to objectives and understand your end user is not always just your customer. It's all the people yeah. in, the, in the process, right? It's taking, taking automation, these eyes that we talk about, it's colloquial, it's clever, but it's true. It's taking those islands, understanding the bigger objective and working in, in individual islands to adopt and design a program that people want to engage in and they want to adopt because it does create simplicity. And that clarity comes from understanding programmatic comes and customer objective. And that sounds, everybody says that. Let's do, let's sit down and do a workshop. We'll come up with your customer objectives. You yeah. have to tightly stitch that into your engineering approach. You have to tight stitch that into your execution and your programmatic approach to automation, but it's terribly, it, it's the most important part to always keep, you know, measure the temperature of the organization through the objective, not through the individual projects. Yeah. And it, gotcha. you can take an existimation program at uh, any of our customers and turn it into a very customer centric, objective based program that gains an adoption. Well, and it sounds like what you guys are talking about also, it feels like there's, things may have started, you know, grassroots when it comes to automation for many of us. And that's how many of us maybe even started a career wise in certain ways, but it, you're really talking about embracing a top down culture. If I'm hearing it correctly, because it, it feels like if you have a culture that extends obviously beyond infrastructure, because we've had multiple examples of, um, but I mean, you're really talking about, let's not forget that we're here to serve the business. Um, I'm going to switch over. Are you ready for to switch over Philip and we can pick up with your uh, show and tell. Absolutely. Are you still getting it set up? Cause yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah, and I wonder if you could reflect for us, what is the reality of what people could expect or what kind of things could they be looking to achieve? What's the best way to set up what you're speaking to here? So one of the things is uh, we, we've got our own journey. So um, one of the businesses, one of the practices under under my uh, remit or that I lord over, depending on how you want to look at it, <laughs> is the enterprise service management practice, which is predominantly service now. But we've got a great automation story there as well. So uh, one of the things that I take people to on a digital platform all the time is about our actual story regarding automation and orchestration um, showing what we actually did and the automations that we executed over time and how that saved us, you know, time and money through automating these things um, yeah. and how many hours are there. Um, this is something that we talk about all the time. We, we came from a world where um, this is our actual you know, service now catalog, where we have a, an, an actual ton of automations that are here that came from what's known as a, a, a citizen developer program. And what that citizen developer program was is where we had a huge backlog in our, um, in our service now catalog of things that our infrastructure folks wanted to get done and that they wanted to, um, to get knocked out, as you can see here. And rather than um, bring to bear the four people that were in our IT service management practice, we opened up a little bit of service now to those infrastructure folks to show them, I think it was about, ended up being like uh, two half days, um, just enough to be dangerous in the dev instance because they were the closest to those particular technologies. And so they were able to write and code those things and, and integrate it in dev. And then they brought it to the IT service management team. I'm, I'm, um, I'm uh, oversimplifying on purpose here, um, but, and then we were able to code release it that same day. So what that did is that rapidly accelerated our journey with automation to get the kind of numbers that we're talking about here, because you know the provisioning of Office 365 users, the Tableau access, the VPN access request, 
those automations were written by those technical specialists that were close to those things. And it was just made real in the service catalog that was in service now. So now we can just click on a button and have it run. Um, and that way we've got the best of both worlds. The people who understand the service now side of things um, can have their cake and eat it too. And the infrastructure folks don't have to sit around and wait for somebody to try to understand their technologies and code it together. And this is a really great example in my definition of mm -hmm. really orchestration, you know, tying two technologies together to deliver a specific business outcome. And it's grown from here. I mean, we've got, we're literally running thousands of automations um, uh, a, a month, um, probably a day if I'm, if uh, I have to go look at the numbers, but that's internally. So we've got a lot of, of, of experience in that. And that's some of the things that, that, uh, that we like to highlight. Now, I don't know if you want me to go to some of the pretty picture stuff, but I'm happy. Yeah, to no, I'm going to have you go to that next. I just wanted to point out that, so anybody, one of the things you were showing there was an article uh, that is linked. You guys will find this, uh, speaking to the audience now, you guys will find this uh, as part of the, um, uh, your login. If you're, if you're watching this live, which I encourage you to do whenever you can, um, then you will certainly be watching it through the platform, which is what uh, we've been showing. And everything you're seeing here is available from that platform, including, and this is a simple example, is that article, which actually is about WWT saving time with Ansible automation. And you guys have been on this journey for a while. I love the fact that you're willing to expose kind of some of your storylines. Um, and it, even though the story is beyond just ServiceNow and Ansible as it focuses on in the article, but I encourage everyone to go look at the article, play that video perhaps that you had kind of brought up a little bit there. But there's more behind here. And so, um, and, and this kind of highlights, because this is funny, sometimes we save this stuff till the very end and just kind of mention it as an aside. So I'm glad you're taking the time to show this. This really shows where if well correct me if i'm unless i'm setting this up wrong but the, what you're kind of showing here is stuff that everyone that the customers have access to uh this is right. something you guys can interact with them on right so wwt.com it's 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 again i'll pretty straightforward wwt.com you click on the magnifying glass you can type dbaas as an example for database as a service um, and there's a lab that we have here that anybody can access the only thing is just your name and your and your email address anybody can access where you can actually play around with ServiceNow connected to cloud assembly, uh, working with Infobox, IPAM and Ansible core to both you know public and private clouds and doing that. Now, this is one of my all time favorite labs that uh, on demand labs, by the way, this is free again, that my team has put together that shows enterprise service management, cloud management platforms, infrastructure automation, those three of my four disciplines. I got DevOps and containers is my fourth discipline. The reason why I'm so proud about this is it actually demonstrates how truly what orchestration looks like. Now, here's the problem, candidly, that I have with this lab. This talks about ServiceNow, multi-cloud, custom naming, database as a, uh, a database as a service. service. But the thing that's missing for me still is what's the business outcome? So this is a great example of where we can have some fantastic automations that do some great things. But the connection to the business layer you know, up, up higher is, you know, I want this story and one of the stories you're gonna be telling is, you use this orchestration to deliver this particular example business outcome for a particular business. Right. Um, there's another one in here, uh, let's see. There's another one here for you know a CI CD pipeline. So you can actually come in and play with an OpenShift CI CD pipeline lab, all these technologies together, hands on keyboards, get your fingers dirty, play around, it, 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 it makes it real. You can make a CI CD pipeline out of a lot of different technologies. So yeah. the point being is that you can automate and orchestrate those things. What is your reason within your business for having a CICD pipeline? How is it helping to achieve your particular business outcomes? Now, it doesn't stop with just you know connecting the nerdy things together. There's got to be a you know a reason for these things. I know, and for this show and the purpose of what we're trying to get across, I'm so trying to hold myself back from wanting you to dive further into the nerdy details uh, on that. But also, Tanner, I'm just curious if you have any thoughts at this stage because. One thing that jumped out at me here is that I also wonder, are we looking, is it fair to hold you guys accountable for having a business outcome and a demo that's designed to be used by many different people to understand how things work? Um, you know, or is that just a matter of, uh, maybe that's just semantics. You, you could have set up a, a fake customer outcome, perhaps. I don't know, Tanner, what are your thoughts on how to do that right? And what's what, what, we're, what we're on so far? Sure. Yeah, I think that's a valid question. I think that one thing to understand is that the platform the visible platform that people can come out and see and share our knowledge. It's meant to be a presentation layer of what we have created and labs we have created, but it's also meant to be a mutual conversation. We have, we have gone down a lot of very advanced pathways here. 
automation, orchestration, all of our respective parts of that process, and many, many others. The thing that we try and do at Worldwide that's specific to this platform is that we want to share every step of that journey. So we have labs out there that can tell tactical results. We also have the ATC as part of our relationship with their clients where we can really create test models. So if they, if lab is something that they're very interested in executing or they want to explore that, we can take that lab and replicate that lab or replicate their environment. That's powerful. It, you know, yeah. it, when, when we've talked about a little bit of IOPS where we literally try to break environments because we much prefer we learn how to break them and learn how to, to uh, you know, protect those things versus doing this in a production environment. It allows us equal parts risk mitigation and equal parts innovation. So it's allowed us to take a lot of these integrations and interoperability and environmental testing for all of these tools, push the envelope with it. So we end up being able to not only deliver great outcomes, but also share all that stuff with people. We went down this pathway, you know, we figured out all of these elements, we figured out how to tie these together, figured out that, you know, you can even measure business outcome based on these particular elements in this particular lab. So it's kind of a, yeah. a way for our customers to share this journey with us and all of these things, automation, orchestration, each of their respective part business, they're all journeys. They're not out of the box execution. So when we show something, yes, we're giving up some, we're, we're opening back to a lot of detail, but same yeah. sense, high tide floats all boats, right? We move our cars forward. We move the state of the industry forward. Well, Philip, I wonder, so we've got five minutes left. I don't want to make sure, and, and you're covering kind of what I would have on my list is making sure that we have our calls to action and I'll just be up front. Now, we want people to uh, reach out to you guys with questions about their automation journey, uh, understand that that you guys are good at handling the ill-defined questions and helping shape them. And you've got various programs to do that. And you're showcasing some of the tools in which you do that. But what's what's most important that we want to make sure we cover here before we depart? The most important thing for me as a uh, as an enterprise service management nerd is, is again, it's focusing on that particular business outcome. It's okay to automate stuff and that's perfectly fine. But don't forget that getting something automated is a lot of times the first step you know there is no one and done with automation once you get that thing automated once you've written that script you know it's the uh, like the build the pool versus maintain the pool analogy right yeah, and so the they're <laughs> right Sorry. one yeah. of my one of my <laughs> one of my oldest best friends uh when i lived overseas said if you want to know what it feels like to own a pool uh go outside the front of your house in the morning and throw a hundred dollar bill in the air every day Right. Yeah. And so there's the there's the cost of maintaining those things on a day to day basis. And then there's also the question around, you know, not only the business outcomes, but is this going to be viable or sustainable long term? So the world is changing. Technology is changing. So the big key takeaway that I would have is, you know, always, always, always make sure you focus on the business outcomes and always, always, always ensure that you understand the effort that's going to be involved long term. Because it's not a set it and forget it kind of scenario. There's yeah. still upkeep and maintenance and the toil that's going to going to come along with that. A lot of times, it makes sense just to kind of pause for a second to think about how those connections work um, and what's going to be the you know the best way to move forward um, for the long term, not just just for now. Well, and I think um, as we as we wrap things, up, I think what what you're saying all makes complete sense. I think there is a reality that as customers hear this. And I don't think it's hard to agree with everything you're saying there because it's not real contentious, but the reality of actually doing some of that stuff can be, in my opinion, overwhelming in terms of just thinking about all the moving parts, all the, um, uh, you know, related uh, activities that are affected by some decisions and things like this. And those are, of course, important to consider. But to make sure we're clear, I want to I want to call out there are links uh, to this for those of you watching the show on the platform, which is how we encourage you to do it. In case you're watching this as a replay, you know, months previously when the Oscars are you know redistributing this for the award ceremony or something. Um, there's yeah. a you guys have a briefing and a workshop. The briefing enterprise service orchestration, and then on the workshop you've got enterprise service orchestration envisioning workshop. Uh, do I have it correct? The briefing is a bit more low key and it doesn't require as much interaction, but the, the workshop perhaps is a little bit of a deeper dive where you're getting a kind of personal exchange of information so that you can make tighter recommendations. Is that an okay way? 100%. To put it? 
Okay. So the enterprise orchestration briefing is very similar to the conversation that we're having right now. Well, we talk very high level around islands of automation. We talk about uh, a, a general maturity curve of automation. It's the whole idea is to try to figure out is to meet you where you're at, if you will. So where are you at right now? You know, what, what are you thinking about? That's the briefing. Uh, when we get into the envisioning workshop, that's to figure out where do we go next? Okay. So you might have some senior executives or some people in the organization that don't necessarily understand uh, enterprise service orchestration or kind of where to start or what, what it all entails. That's this year. That's the enterprise. Service oh, you can help with that briefing. too. So the explanation right. to other members. Okay. Other people on that side. Okay. Right. And then the envisioning workshop takes it, takes it to the next level, which is okay. Of all the things that we could do, dramatic pause with all the things that we could do within our, our, our automation journey, you know, where should we start? And it's about getting the, the right people in the room, talking about what the pain points are. We got, we have some fantastic uh, ideation uh, specialists in, in WWT that can help out with that and we go, okay, so based off of where you are today and where you're trying to go, these are the type of automation things that we can bring to bear. And what's incredibly important is to get an understanding about what you already have because you probably already have the way, the means of getting to those end results with some of the technology and some of the people that you have. It might just be need to be a, um, a, for instance, a skill up or a coaching standpoint, or it might be a lab as a service type thing where you know we can you know build an environment that looks very similar so we can experiment to figure out where to go next. So there's a lot of different ways to go, but this workshop here is designed to help out with that to say, hey, we all have uh, the uh, briefing is what I like to call the sheep dip. So we all have a basic understanding about the language and what's there. Wait, 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 now wait, wait, the, wait, 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 wait. Sheep dip? You sheep know I couldn't let that go off. by. I'm not I'm not that familiar with that one. Uh, again, when, when you live in Australia, is this okay years, to say? Up some vernacularisms. Okay. Yes. So sheep dip is a term they use in Australia around, uh, you know, dipping sheep, you know, to make sure that there's no bug, bugs on them, but it's just, you know, really quick. Oh, yeah, sure. So, yeah, sure. We all dip our sheep. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was thinking of like a, what is the, 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 the sandwich I never understood the London dip. No. Aju. Aju. Yeah. Aju, it's like, the French yeah. bless you. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> oh, sorry. So, so cheap dip. To, it's like sheep. Basically dip. to make this sure everybody's is golden. On the same this is golden point. advice here. Keep going. Of uh, the same playing field. Everybody understands the same language. And then the envisioning workshops, we take a step okay. forward to figure out, okay, where do we execute next? And then yeah. from there, there's a whole myriad of other things that we can do um, for them from there. Well, and I, I wrote down, I want to thank you guys because I wrote down, one, I kept writing down words that Tanner was throwing out. Now I have to add sheep dip to this because <laughs> Tanner already hit us with archipel archipelago and he'd use lexicon and let's see, nomenclature. I know what the words mean, don't get me wrong, <laughs> but I don't often hear them used in my conversations and I like that. But but the one one key point that I think is kind of a, and it just really feels like it's just this simple and what I've learned from you, Philip, is it, there, it we need to understand the difference between automation and orchestration and understand that if we lead with orchestration, that's going to help us keep that outcome focus that the automation can accurately plug into. Because it, when we start losing sight of that is where the frustration starts to creep in and feeling like, I feel like I'm, I'm working towards something, but I don't know what I'm achieving, which is horrible for anybody in any job. And, um, and I feel like kind of laying some of these things out help. And I really appreciate these resources you guys have made available. I encourage everyone in the audience to take advantage of these things at any depth as is appropriate because it's all very custom and it's designed to kind of build that relationship so you can start getting uh, more value for your buck and your time, which is really what I think a lot of this boils down to is how can we be better about our time? So some good resources there. Tanner Bechtel, thank you so much. Phil Palmer. Certainly thank you as well. Thank your teams behind the scenes that, that also put all these things together because I know you represent quite a few people. And thank you guys for watching. Appreciate your time. Please join us on the next Tech 37. And uh, we look forward to it. Take care.